Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to The Economist Briefing by the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. My name is Adrian Pabst. I'm one of two deputy directors. My particular brief is Social Policy and Political Economy. Thank you very much for joining us today as we present our latest forecast and the new edition of the Institute's Review. No doubt the US election is on everyone's mind. It would seem that the outcome is too close to call and the final result still very much in balance. This adds, I think, to the radical uncertainty which characterizes not just politics, but also the state of the economy, here and elsewhere. Today's briefing will seek to provide some clarity on where the UK and the world economy are headed, and also some uh, you know, more analysis on critical social issues in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm delighted to be joined by many colleagues from across the Institute. We have set this up to allow many researchers to present their work here this morning so that those present here can get to know them better. And everyone on this call should feel free to contact us, particularly if you want to sponsor our work. Now, this is certainly not an election party. It's more like a jamboree event to showcase the breadth and depth of our work. Among the presenters, there'll be many familiar faces, but I'd like also to introduce two colleagues who have recently joined us. Our new Deputy Director for Macroeconomics, Dr. Handa Kuchuk, and also our Associate Director uh, Associate Research Director for Social Policy, Dr. Claudine Boyer-Crane. Now, without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to our first speaker, Barry Naisbet, who's our Associate Research Director for Global Macroeconomics. Barry, over to you. Thank you, Adrian, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'd like to just run through very quickly our uh, prospects for the world economy, which are in the uh, latest review. Very much teamwork on the world economy. And so I'd like to very much thank my colleagues here on the screen for all their hard work. In terms of headlines, I, I, I think that uh, a key point to make is first of all, that uh, since our August forecast three months ago, the global number of COVID Barry, I think we seem to have lost you briefly. Okay, we're back again. Yeah. The economic out sorry, okay. The economic outlook remains uncertain. Um, countries are at different stages of the still spreading pandemic and different stages of unlocking or relocking. In that context, where we changed our forecast for global GDP growth or lack of global GDP growth this year. Um, we were expecting a fall of 5%, now four and a half. Um, and we've marked down our forecast for the increase in growth next year from six and a quarter to 5%. We think the main case risks are still on the downside, um, certainly from the virus and certainly from a possibility of a second spike. But, uh, but on the positive side, the hopes for a vaccine being developed are three months nearer than they were in August. In terms of policy, one of the key things is the public debt to GDP ratios, certainly in advanced economies, have widely risen by around 20 percentage points. And on inflation, we expect it to remain low in the short term, with about one three quarter percent projected for OECD inflation um, next year. Just to run through some of the headlines within the forecast, um, we've seen lockdowns leading to the deepest contraction in the post-war era. Um, and we're projecting that for some major advanced economies, they won't re return to the pre-COVID, so end of 2019 level of GDP until a couple of years time. So in the US, the middle of 22, and in the Euro area, the middle of 23. Some specific countries like Italy um, won't return till 24 or later. But China, as you'll see from the right hand side chart, has already regained its GDP level. Can we... It's just important to think about how far the world has changed, very much with the US on our mind today. If you can all think back to a year ago, we were probably discussing whether US GDP growth would be. 1.9% or 2.1% and getting quite excited about those differences after the percentage point. 
Now, if you look at these charts, you'll see a comparison of our forecast from last November with this November. You can see the huge markdowns that we've made from rising in growth now to falls in GDP. Big changes, particularly for the UK, France and Italy. Um, and in emerging economies, a huge change for China and South Africa as well. So markdowns across the world and a, a very different world. Of course, GDP is not the only thing that matters, and my colleagues will talk about that later, very much in context of the UK. But in terms of unemployment or employment, you can see the huge fall there's been in the number of jobs in the US. The number of jobs now in the US is back to what it was in about 2015. And you can see the rise in unemployment rates in Canada and the US particularly, but less of a rise in Europe and the UK as job support measures have held on to workers with companies. Um, given our outlook, we're expecting those un unemployment rates in Europe and the UK to rise as we go forward. In terms of limiting the short-term damage, we've obviously seen huge fiscal stimulus in many countries. And as I said earlier, the government debt to GDP ratios have now risen to levels that are multi-year highs. We face an uncertain future. As last time, if you saw our fan chart, we had a go at something probably slightly different. What we've done here is again is repeat that, but what we're looking at is the level of GDP, not the GDP growth rate. And what we're, what we're looking at is the possibility of a second spike in many countries or in di different countries at different times in the first half of next year. And we assume an intensity of effect, which is about 60% of the effect that we saw earlier this year. And so what we get is that classic W picture that, that we all keep talking about. And you'll notice if you're very keen eyed that in the medium term, the center of the central band for growth there is slightly lower than our main case scenario, which indicates the degree of scarring going forward. The uncertainty impulse has reduced economic activity and it remains the dominant feature of the economic outlook. While economic activity has picked up in Q3, as we can see in Europe at the moment, it's clearly fragile to further lockdowns if the virus surges. In terms of the medium term, I think it's too early to tell whether the experience of the pandemic, the lockdowns, might have changed behavior in such a way that medium term economic prospects are fundamentally altered. Things like lower cross, cross border flows of goods, services, people and capital, change package of patterns of working. All these things are important issues for the medium term. In terms of inflation, while our central forecast has changed very little, the risks either side of that, either of much lower inflation or much higher inflation, we think have increased. And in terms of policy, the, the premium probably still remains on coordinating global healthcare treatment and research to beat the virus and restore confidence in mobility and trade. I just thought I'd say two or three very quick things on the US election, not, not predicting who is actually going to win, but I think one of the things that I think is a key issue is which party wins the Senate and the House of Representatives. A president with party control of the two houses is a very different prospect than one that doesn't have control as we've seen in the past four to eight years. And a major issue obviously is uh, the policy to combat COVID-19. US has had eight million cases and one in five deaths globally has been in the US, whereas about one in 20 or one in 25 people globally lives in the US. And for the UK, um, the important issue is clearly the trade deal. It's difficult to judge what kind of deal may be an offer with either of the candidates as president, especially with ongoing US and Euro, Euro area tension, trade tensions, or how the result might affect the current UK EU negotiations. Let me just leave you with a summary of the um, forecast that we have in our press notice. And uh, with that, thank you for listening and your attention. And I'll hand back to Adrian. Barry, thank you very much uh, indeed for that concise yet comprehensive uh, overview of the state of the global economy. That's uh, really very helpful.
I now like to turn to my colleague, uh, Dr. Kima White, who's a senior economist at NISA. Kima, over to you. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you, Barry. So yeah, um, we're just going to speak a little bit about one of the one of the boxes that we've done in our um, recent review. So in this box, what we're looking at is um, what we call a new a new kind of economic downturn, one that um, is affecting the services sector more than um, anything else. Now, what we've seen in this um, new economic downturn, we have seen exceptionally deep quarterly falls in GDP in the second quarter of this year. But within that fall, what we have also seen is we've seen unprecedented falls in the service sector, um, in service sector output. Now, in a usual recession, what we normally see is we normally see firms activity in terms of um, consumption and investment, typically affecting the industrial sector. But normally we wouldn't see this sort of um, scale of, um, of, of downturn in the, in the services sector. Now, in previous recession, if you if you think back to the great financial crisis, industrial production showed substantially greater fall in output than GDP itself, with the relative uh, lack of cyclicality or the cyclical volatility in service sector um, helping to reduce that overall economic downturn. Now, if we look at the, the graph that we have here, now we can see that industrial production in advanced economies, because the, the the box focuses on a select group of countries from um, advanced economies. Um, what we've seen is we've seen that industrial production has fallen by a similar percent to that in the recession caused by the global financial crisis. But in this case, the service sector has not provided that sort of buffer because of the, the hit it took from the pandemic and the associated lockdown measures to, 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 um, to, to sort of buffer that drop in, um, in GDP. Now, if we <clears throat> look um, more closely at the falls in the service sector, what we can see is that it is not uniform um, across countries. Looking at our table, we can see that the UK and the French economy have the largest falls in, in service sector output. Now, part of this may represent um, the ongoing trends in the sectors across these countries. But the main explanation is um, is due to the extraordinary restriction placed on citizens um, in lockdown. Now, if you think about it, the incidence of the pandemic has not been uniform across countries and the timing and the extent of the lockdowns and the support um, and the support measures for citizens affected by lockdowns have also not been uniform across, um, uniform across countries rather, which is why we're seeing the sort of differing um, magnitude of falls in the service sector. However, the unprecedented um, reduction in service sector has been severe in all six countries that we've examined. And uh, the period that which we're focusing, which we focus on is the a comparison between Q4 of last year and the second quarter of this year. Now, what we take a closer look, what we what we've seen is that not all parts of the large service sector have been um, affected equally. Um, other services, which includes the likes of arts, entertainment and recreation and the trade, transport and accommodation um, sectors <coughs> have experienced the deepest fall in output as the effects of the reductions in social interactions and public gatherings um, took a major um, um, had a major hit on mobility. Now we have a more detailed um, breakdown of, of the of, of for, for the respective countries in in the review. But here, what we've, what we've seen is we've seen an average. We took an average of the fall across the six countries examined, and we can see that the biggest falls have been in other services, which is um, typically more affected <clears throat> by social distancing. Now, what we can see here, the graph on the left provides uh, an examination of the association between the scale of restrictions as measured by the Oxford stringency index and the change in the output in the services sector between, um, as I mentioned, Q4 of last year and the second quarter of this year. And what we can see is that there's a general pattern of uh, larger service sector output falls in countries where lockdown restrictions have been uh, more stringent. 
Now the chart on the right shows the Google mobility index, um, indices for the for selected countries. And clearly what we can see is um, increased um, travel and transport activity as lockdown have eased into the um, third quarter of this year. However, with lockdowns um, being reimposed in a number of countries, including the UK, these indices have begun to fall again. I'll just leave you with a few takeaway points. As I've mentioned, this is a different type of recession, one that is um, affecting the services sector as opposed to the, um, to the, to the to industrial sector. And this is a common feature across um, major advanced economies. Now, whether the, the, the recovery within the service sector will depend largely on these measures um, being, being, um, being removed. And of course, there might be a lack of confidence and willingness um, for, for on the part of consumers and, in, and investors until there is a vaccine. Um, in service industries remain in the front line and the economic front line and could fall again should there be a second wave. Thank you. Kima, thank you very much for some fascinating insights on the pattern of this uh, recession and what may uh, yet await us, uh, depending on how the second wave goes and further lockdowns might or might not take place. Thank you very much. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Corrado Machiarelli, uh, a principal economist at NISA, uh, for his uh, research in, uh, in the review. Uh, Corrado, over to you. Thank you very much, Adrian. Um, so uh, indeed, I'm going to talk uh, about the um, second box uh, that you'll find in the um, issue of the, the review. So the box is on government bond term premium during the pandemic. So with monetary policy um, at the um, zero lower bound in uh, developed economy, the conventional view is that uh, countries should deploy the fiscal stimulus. But, um, Obviously, this fiscal stimulus um, is enacted um, with um, a monetary policy uh, support in the sense that uh, we do observe a continuation of central banks' asset purchases uh, to provide fiscal space, allowing governments to support the provision of services and transfers, especially to mitigate the health and welfare impact of the shock across the society. Obviously, those uh, central bank bond purchases have a direct effect on um, on, on, on bond rates uh, and uh, on the liquidity of the bond market itself. Um, in order to investigate this channel further, what we've done in this box is to decompose treasury yields um, at um, long maturities so of 10 years uh, into two components. One is the expectation of the future path of short-term treasury yields and a second component, which is the term premium which essentially represents investors' uh, insurance that uh, interest rates are not going to evolve as expected. Uh, obviously, uh, there is some uncertainty around those estimates and um, bear in mind those are indeed estimates because the term premium is not a variable which we can be, we can uh, directly observe and it must be estimated. Um, so we use uh, the sort of zero coupon yield data which are available at daily frequency and extract term premium as we explained in the box. And um, what I'm gonna present here are results for the US, UK, and uh, some selected European countries. Um, of course, we've run the exercise for a larger number of countries, but in a process of conciseness, uh, we only focus on a few. Um, so the term premium that we obtain is typically a countercyclical variable, meaning that uh, it would increase during recessions and fall during recoveries. Now, this is not a feature that we would observe uh, during the uh, period after COVID, uh, namely uh, March 2020, which is when we observed most of the peak in the term premium across country. Uh, and that is also different from what we've witnessed during the great financial crisis. So during the great financial crisis, there was indeed you know, a very severe shock that uh, was mirrored by increasing the term premium. Uh, this is not what we observe uh, during uh, COVID times. And um, so if you look at um, the relationship on the uh, graph on the right hand side, which essentially depicts the uh, correlation between the US term premium, as an example, and uh, VIX, uh, which is a well known measure for uh, volatility globally. So you can see that in the um, red dots, this is the correlation, the relation before um, COVID-19. So you can see that there is a positive association between the term premium and, and volatility, meaning you know when financial markets are very nervous, that reflects into a higher term premium. Uh, 
But you can see that uh, if we look at the gray dots, uh, then these uh, relation uh, has flattened uh, post COVID, suggesting that an increase in volatility has not been associated with uh, an increase in the term premium. So we ask essentially why. So as we can see in the next um, slide, the, one of the reasons for which we uh, believe uh, this is not the case after COVID uh, has to do clearly with long-term trends. So obviously uh, bond rates have been on a long declining path since uh, the mid uh, 80s, but also there is monetary policy which plays a major role in the sense that uh, monetary policy stands in particular, if we take monetary policy after 2009, so where we have this sort of commitment of central banks to keep interest rates low, uh, that of course has affected, particularly through signaling, uh, the treasury bond yields and the term premium in turn. But also we should uh, consider that there are other factors, such as uh, international risk as uncertainty, as well as monetary policy developments abroad. Um, and finally, one other channel that we have identified in the box uh, is indeed the fact that with COVID, we have an increasing saving and obviously lower investment demand. Um, these increasing saving uh, could be both the result of an increase in precautionary saving, but also the result of forced savings, so to say, because of course the uh, of shortages and uh, the availability to buy, um, say, goods or access services which are only uh, in local proximity. So if we um, conclude with the last chart, I just want to give you a few takeaways with, uh, with, with this chart indeed. So you can see that the bottom uh, left chart uh, looks at the term premium um, since um, March, essentially, or since January with a peak in March. And you can see that there is some movement there, particularly Italy seem to spike up. But then if we put that in comparison with uh, a longer term series, which is a graph on the right hand side, you can see that the movement between January and October 2020 seem indeed negligible uh, compared to what uh, we have observed uh, previously. So there are a lot of movements in the term premium between uh, US, UK and Germany, and that is suggestive of the fact that indeed there is an international uh, um, um, sort of movement, so international dimension of those changes. So going forward, we think that expectations about the future stance of monetary policy, as well as the composition of the central bank balance sheet, which also suggests how much headroom uh, uh, central banks will have for further stimulus uh, will influence term premium. So definitely uh, this is a relationship which we should watch for, particularly as the boundary between non-conventional and monetary policy and de deficit finance government support or fiscal policy uh, might change in the future. So Adrian, back to you. Prado, thank you very much uh, for some really uh, uh, interesting reflections on the interaction between fiscal and, and monetary policy at present and, and going forward. Um, before I, I uh, hand over to uh, my colleague Handel Kuchuk, just to say, of course, we'd welcome your, your questions. You can put them in the chat and we may then call on you later to ask them uh, and you can address them to uh, our panelists individually or, or to the group. We really look forward to your questions, so please, uh, please do uh, put them in the chat for now. Uh, so I'd like now to uh, hand over to uh, Dr. Hannah Kuchuk, who, as I said at the beginning, is our new Deputy Director for Macroeconomics. Hannah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adrian. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to present our UK economy forecast prepared together with my colleagues Cyril Lenoel and uh, Rory McQueen. Um, so just to give you uh, a few headlines, uh, the recovery that started in May is now uh, looking quite fragile due to the fast unfolding second wave, the resultant November lockdown and uh, the looming Brexit. Uh, we obtained our main case scenario before the announcement of the November lockdown and we forecast GDP to fall by 10.5% in 2020 and rise by 5.9% in 2021. Now, we think that because of the uh, second wave becoming more severe compared to our baseline and the associated new lockdown, uh, we are likely to see a contraction in GDP in quarter four, and we are likely uh, to see a GDP fall in 2020 by around 11 to 12% instead of 10.5%. And looking beyond 2021, and uh, looking at 2021 and beyond, uh, the outlook is extremely uncertain and depends critically on 
whether we win the fight against COVID-19. And we expect the rise in unemployment to around 7% and further to around 8% in the first half of 2021, as the employment support schemes are expected to be unwind. Uh, we think that the furlough extension until December associated with the new lockdown is likely to keep this lower in Q4. Uh, and we, the fiscal policy will continue to absorb the shock. So we expect the public sector net debt uh, to GDP ratio to approach around 110% in 2021. So uh, this uh, table summarizes the main macro uh, variables forecast. I've already mentioned uh, the GDP and employment forecasts, um, and I'll come to the inflation uh, forecast um, briefly. But here, I just wanted to underline uh, the assumptions under our um, around our main case forecast scenario. So we have incorporated resurgence of the virus, but no second national lockdown. So this was a downside risk. Uh, and uh, the recovery beyond 2021 was conditional on infection rates gradually being brought under control. We uh, incorporated continued monetary and fiscal stimulus, and we switched our Brexit assumption from a soft Brexit to a one where there is a free trade agreement with the EU entering into force from next year. So our fan chart incorporates second wave risks and uh, downside risks going uh, in the long term uh, man, uh, related to the risks of long term scarring. So we had already uh, built in a risk of a second wave. So uh, with the uh, lockdown, new lockdown assumptions, uh, GDP in the short term is likely to stay below the black line, but uh, be well inside the range of the deep, deep red uh, that you can see here. So um, this fund chart shows you the likelihood of zigzags in uh, GDP uh, unless uh, there is a uh, the virus is brought under control. Uh, looking at inflation, inflation has been weak in recent months, standing at 0.5% in September. We forecast it to remain weak initially, but uh, rise gradually to 1.7% at end of next year uh, and 2% in 2022. And we expect the bank rate to remain at uh, 0.1 until 2024. Uh, yeah, and um, the fiscal policy has uh, been a, a big shock absorber, and uh, there's a need for continued fiscal support given that uh, infection isn't brought under control and there's a second lockdown. So, in the main case scenario. Uh, we uh, forecast public sector net debt to peak slightly below 107%, but, that, but as I told you, this is likely to be higher with the new, uh, new announcements. So the main line is uh, there is no need to panic about fiscal deterioration. Higher borrowing is to be financed by domestic saving, and this is in line with our forecast for 2021 as well, uh, forecast on sectoral balances. A uh, budget and spending plan is needed, but uh, fiscal policy need not be a constraint this time. We think that the tax rises should wait until after the economic effects of the pandemic have uh, dissipated. So I have uh, briefly mentioned our main case scenario, which is based on an FTA with the EU and talked about how you know we incorporate downside risks related to COVID very briefly. Now I, we turn to another structural shock, the end of the Brexit transition uh, period and how it might affect the main case scenario. So the main point is that Brexit reaches parts of the economy that are less affected by COVID as shown by this graph. So this graph plots uh, the exposure to COVID-19 and uh, exposure to Brexit shocks. So some sectors like um, uh, manufacturing and finance, which you can see uh, there, uh, are, uh, have been less exposed to COVID-19, but will be more exposed to Brexit. So the shock is broadened. Uh, the shock to output and employment is broadened by the looming Brexit. So we have uh, done an explicit simulation to um, highlight the effects of a no deal Brexit. And uh, the graph here shows you the GDP impact of a no deal Brexit compared with the baseline. Um, so the GDP would be one and a half percent lower in the long run under a no deal Brexit compared to our uh, FTA. Uh, and the channels of impact uh, are actually the same, uh, similar to an FTA, but are, uh, are coming at with larger, 
with larger effects. So uh, we are um, building in chronic uncertainty and lower FDI, holding back recovery of investments, higher barrier, higher barriers, barriers to trade and productivity weakness in the long run. So the adjustment, the, the difference might look small, but it's because these channels of impact are already uh, quite in force in the baseline as well. Now, uh, let's look at how we could uh, put some numbers to the November lockdown. So we already had a separate simulation, risk simulation of a second lockdown for a full quarter, uh, and uh, which showed us this deep W with a second uh, dip in, in quarter one. And we, in this simulation, we forecasted a three month lockdown, but the channels uh, being similar to the first lockdown, like drastic fall in consumer spending, investments, fall in labor, productivity, hours worked, and a higher cost of capital due to high heightened risk. Um, so we, we use some of the insights and results of this uh, simulation to say something about this new uh, shorter uh, lockdown. But when doing so, we also took into effect into account the large sectoral impacts of COVID-19. So uh, COVID-19 is a highly sectoral shock, as we all know. So uh, the figure on the left-hand side shows you the dispersion in the gross value added change between April and February across sectors. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you, you can see how much uh, these sectors have recovered. And also the furlough use, for example, uh, has been very much associated with the change in the output of each sector. And, uh, uh, this has also uh, varied uh, a lot in the, uh, recovered a lot in the um, period uh, running until August. So why is this important? So when uh, looking, doing some quick calculations about the November lockdown impact, we have considered, uh, can we move to the other slide? We have considered the effects of uh, the sectoral recovery, uh, we have looked at the sectoral recovery trends from August to April uh, and made some assumptions as to how much of this recovery would be lost in each sector. So uh, uh, retail uh, and hospitality have been the sectors that have recovered most. And we think that with the second lockdown, they will be losing much of this recovery. But uh, whereas we assume that education will not lose much of the recovery it has um, it has recorded uh, since since april so we have done some uh, different we have made some different assumptions as to the uh, drop uh, as to the uh, recovery that will be lost in each sector and we now think that um, the quarterly contraction in q4 would be likely to be around 3% and this would be likely uh, to lead to a contraction uh, in 2020 of around uh, 12% So just to summarize, uh, the recovery is quite fragile with the second uh, wave, the new lockdown and the end of the Brexit transition period. Uh, we are likely to see a contraction in Q4 and the GDP contracting by around 12% in uh, this year. Unemployment is set to rise with the um, fiscal policy uh, absorbing uh, to a large extent the shock. So thank you. Now over to you, Adrian. Anna, thank you so much uh, for for this, um, you know, uh, overview of so many issues, growth, unemployment, the fiscal position, uh, COVID and Brexit. Uh, and what's coming out very clearly is that the V-shaped recovery is very unlikely to materialize now. We're more looking at W-shape and then, as you say, uncertainty is uh, the greatest um, so characteristic of, of, of these, these uh, difficult uh, and tough times. Thank you so much. And I'd like to hand on to Rory McQueen, who's a principal economist at NISA. Rory, over to you. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, I'm just going to briefly talk about the labour market recovery, government policies to help that. And um, thanks to begin with to Andrew Benito, who did a blog for us a few months ago and on whose work this is based. So very quickly, um, you see the number of vacancies fell immediately at the start of the crisis to very low level uh, and only really began to pick up in May. Um, unemployment, on the other hand, didn't immediately, <coughs> excuse me, rise. Uh, it has started to, to, to rise in the last few months. By the way, the red bars are the official data, black dots are some interpolations, um, rough interpolations on my part, 
but it didn't really begin to take off until May, and even then, pretty slowly. <clears throat> and here we see this represented in the beverage curve, which is the empirical relationship between the number of vacancies and the level of unemployment in the UK. That uh, red dots represent the last 20 years, and you can see, obviously, traditionally, when un unemployment is low, that's associated with a high number of vacancies and vice versa. Uh, but in grey, you can see the dots related to the COVID period, where the number of vacancies fell very quickly, but the unemployment rate didn't. And that, of course, is thanks to the coronavirus job retention scheme. This is our main case forecast for unemployment, which I'll skip over, really. It was conducted before Saturday's announcement, but um, that's the sort of ballpark which we were looking at. And we may just see a slightly later peak as a result of the extension of the furlough scheme in November. <clears throat> so this is a graphical representation of the beverage curve, which you can see in red there. And where we are on the beverage curve is often described as being set by a job creation curve, which is the decision making of employers and their level of job creation for a given level of unemployment. One of the things which happened at the start of the COVID pandemic was that job creation obviously fell. And in this version, that's represented by a rotation to the right, but basically a falling of job creation. Uh, as you can see, uh, employers stopped hiring and uh, we can begin to think about marginal low productivity jobs beginning to be shared as well as, um, for example, social distancing increases input costs for employers. However, the government moved in the beverage curve so that rather than going to a high level of unemployment to match that low number of vacancies, we now with the new beverage curve see the very low number of vacancies but no rise in unemployment rate. However, as the CJRS is removed, which is now a month later, we would expect the beverage curve to move out to the right and the number of vacancies to rise along with the unemployment rate rising. So in, in, in the attempt to stop that happening, to move to that position on the right of the graph, the government then tries to raise job creation. So they want to allow the beverage curve to move out to the right. It's costing them money to maintain the furlough scheme, but they don't want to, unemployment to raise. So then rise to, they need to raise the job creation curve. Here are some of the ways in which they've said that they're intending to do it. We have job subsidy schemes being brought back, the Kickstart scheme, which is supposed to create hundreds of thousands of new jobs, which is uh, not dissimilar to, sim to, 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 to programmes which UK governments of the past have introduced. We also have talk about training schemes and direct job creation. Now, especially the first two of those, but the, the, the middle one in particular is really about trying to raise productivity. And this is the key for raising that job creation curve if workers are more productive, then obviously there's more of an incentive for employers to hire them. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so what we have, thinking back to that, that um, graph, which I showed you a minute ago, is an attempt to raise the job creation curve. The problem that we think may occur for the government is that if it tries to move the beverage curve outwards to allow it to rise to the right at the same time, that may cause productivity to be lower than it would be otherwise. This is because unemployment causes scarring, especially at the time of recession. Um, people are likely to be at work for a long time. You lose matches, you lose skills. We look into this in the box in the UK chapter in the review. And as a result, productivity of uh, the economy is lower. The result of that potentially is that the government is trying to lift the job creation curve at the same time as its withdrawal of the CJRS is actually holding job creation down. This could be a real problem for them. Uh, our conclusions are that we believe job creation is necessary. Job protection is also necessary. It's not going to be enough. It's not going to be sufficient and it won't work to try to replace a programme of job protection, such as a furlough scheme entirely at the end of November, for example, with job creation. You will need to do both if you want to keep unemployment down. Rory, thank you very much. Uh, some really uh, interesting trade-offs there uh, and also uh, highlighting the potential for 
uh, government intervention to avoid perhaps uh, high unemployment or indeed a drop in productivity, especially a time when this government is talking about leveling up uh, the North. So very interesting uh, indeed, thank you very much. Um, I'd now like to turn to um, uh, my colleague, Dr. Claudine Boy Crane, who's an Associate Research Director for Social Policy. Um, and this is really now more about the social scarring uh, and uh, builds at the same time on the economic scarring we've already heard about. So Claudine, over to you. Thank you, Adrian. Good morning, everyone. Yes, so we, um, our box looked at the implications of schools reopening in the UK. Um, obviously, over lockdown, in the first instance, children missed, a, a majority of children missed a number of months of education. And it's clear that keeping schools open is a priority moving into this second lockdown. It's also fair to say that we don't yet know the full implications um, of the impact of that first lockdown on um, educational outcomes, employment prospects or earning potential. But we do have evidence um, emerging that the um, initial closures of schools and early year settings did have short term consequences. Um, and so this would indicate that keeping schools open is a positive step. We know, for example, that the disadvantaged gap is likely to have widened as a result of lockdowns, um, partly because of access to remote learning technologies. So there is a digital divide between the um, richest and poorest uh, children in our communities. Um, so we know that children in areas of disadvantage have far less access to uh, technology needed to access remote learning, for example. We know that all children spent less time learning during lockdown. Um, this uh, uh, reduction in learning is much greater for the poorest children in society. So this figure here shows data that comes from the um, IFS which shows that at primary school over lockdown, uh, children were spending about an hour and a half less per day on learning activities. In secondary school, this was about two hours less per day. And if you look at that uh, in terms of the gap between the richest and poorest children, you can see that children in the poorest areas spent much less time than children um, who were more affluent um, in terms of those learning activities. And in, in the case of secondary school, that, that equality already existed, but is exacerbated by this lockdown. Um, we also know that um, a number of children, about 2.2 million children, were already um, suffering from what they call the toxic trio. So um, uh, substance abuse, um, domestic violence, parental mental health. Um, and those issues are likely to have um, increased over lockdown and also um, some children who may not have been subject to those issues um, prior to lockdown, those issues may have arisen as a result of lockdown and schools being closed will have had um, an impact in that some of those children may well have been either lacking support or have gone unidentified because schools play um, a massive part in, um, in identifying and supporting children who are um, struggling with, with those issues. Um, we also know that children with um, special educational needs, for example, have been um, uh, differentially affected as well in terms of lack of specialist support. Um, those children were allowed to go into school and they were classed as vulnerable children. But we do know from the Children's Commissioner that many risk assessments were not done. And so um, many of those children still were, were not able to go into school. So they were missing out on that specialist support that helped them to access that learning. And we know that sustained time out of school may increase difficulties in readjusting um, and um, getting back into the, the learning mode. In terms of long term impacts, the World Bank suggests that school closures could result in average reductions in yearly earnings of around $872. Um, dollars. Uh, $872 sorry, per month, um, which is about uh, per year, which is about £16,000 lifetime earnings. So quite a substantial reduction in earnings. We also know that in terms of labour supply and productivity, parents were spending around three hours less per day in paid work, in paid work compared to six and a half hours um, in paid work um, in 2014-15 and that 30% of parents said that home um, schooling had a negative impact on their um, working life. So taking all of that into account, it looks like schools reopening is a positive step, particularly in light of um, inconsistent findings around infection rates um, being linked to schools. 
And this also will increase retail demand in terms of school related items and increased footfall in terms of um, parents and children resuming school journeys and just being more out and about. But all of that has to be balanced with the increased pressure on um, schools and teachers, um, increased workload, particularly around ensuring that remote learning is available for children who do then have to self isolate. Um, we, there's also increased uh, workload around COVID procedures, increased stress and anxiety. This figure here, you can clearly see peaks um, in the levels of work related anxiety that are aligned with key points in the journey of the pandemic. Um, and you can see that while that dropped off over the summer holidays in August, you can see a sharp rise again. Um, and that's you know, in line with schools reopening. So we know that, that the schools being open is putting an enormous amount of stress and pressure on our, on our teachers and not just teachers, but on all school staff. So you know, the people that, that work in the, in the kitchens, the people that do all the cleaning, you know, th this is um, a, a massive systemic um, stress. There's a lot of uncertainty around staffing with sudden absences due to self-isolation, lack of available testing, and, um, and then with the addition of um, continued Ofsted visits and the um, continued plan to have exams next year, um, that's all putting a, 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 an amazing amount of pressure on, on our um, school, on our school staff. So, um, in short, schools reopening does seem to be a positive move, but will require significant investment and continued monitoring so that we can really ensure that we understand the implications and can then um, target uh, funding appropriately to ensure that the, the right support is in place for both staff and students. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much uh, for these uh, insights into the complex uh, benefits uh, and, and costs of, of keeping schools open or indeed reopening them. Um, that's uh, going to be an ongoing issue as we have repeated lockdowns. Mm -hmm. and uh, Hence, this is very much uh, a, you know, a live situation like so much else that's being discussed this morning. I'd now like to turn to our final speaker, Elena Lizaskauta, who's an economist at NISA. She will talk to us about destitution. Elena, over to you. All right, thank you, Adrian, and thanks everyone for uh, tuning in, and thank you all the panelists. So uh, what we're going to do now is to look at the effects of the pandemic on the poorest part of the population and explore also regional effects on destitution levels. So this is the research uh, that we are carrying on uh, together with Arna. And so um, we obtained destitution projections at the national and regional levels um, to the year 2022 uh, by merging the powers of uh, our micro simulation model, Linda, and together with projections from NISER's uh, global macroeconomic model, NIGEM. Uh, so we're uh, looking at the impacts um, on, uh, of this pandemic uh, including, uh, so taking into account the UK government's job support scheme uh, and uh, also the upcoming um, effects of Brexit in, in case of a free trade agreement. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, how do we define destitution? Uh, well, we, in this particular research, we um, agreed on, on, on the um, definition uh, using Joseph uh, Roundtree Foundation's uh, income, income definition. So uh, we consider that uh, a person is uh, falls into the destitution population in a single uh, person household if their income is below 70 uh, pounds a week. If there is an ad additional adult in, in the household, uh, it's um, additional 30 pounds. So that would be 100 pounds for two uh, adult um, um, household and every additional child uh, needs uh, 20 pounds per week, additional 20 pounds per week. So if the income falls below this level, we consider uh, people and, and a household uh, as destitute. So uh, during this pandemic, uh, we observed three main sources um, of uh, increase in uh, destitution levels. So first of all, it's um, those people who are losing their livelihood, so unemployed people. Uh, however, in, in 2020, uh, we still have uh, some government support. So this is uh, moderated, the effects are moderated in 2020. However, we will see that in 2021 and 2022, the effects uh, mainly come from 
uh, increase in unemployment. So the second source is uh, those people who are still employed, but their um, income is increasing, uh, decreasing uh, due to the, the, the effects of the pandemic. Uh, their, their wages might be decreasing. And the third source, uh, very important in uh, 2020, is uh, self-employed people who are moved to extreme poverty, either because of income loss or because their businesses uh, are not being sufficiently supported by the government's small business schemes. So these are the three main sources that we define. And so now to the results. Um, in 2020, destitution rises because of impacts on self-employed and unemployed. And as I said, it's mainly coming from self-employed um, people because uh, it is moderated for unemployed workers by um, furlough scheme. However, unemployment is the main issue in 2021 and 2022. Um, sorry. Okay, and um, so overall, uh, on average, uh, in three years, uh, the destitution levels uh, are increasing from 1.8 million to 3.6 million, which is a huge uh, it's double increase because of this pandemic. Uh, so, and then uh, regionally, um, we will see now a map in a second, but uh, three point, uh, it increases for, from 3.6 percent. Uh, to 7.6% uh, with seven out of the 12 um, uh, regions facing destitution rates over 7% uh, of the population. Uh, so the popu population and destitution were almost twice as high or more in all regions. And if we now dissect this um, and, and look at the specific effects for uh, regions, London seems to be suffering the least uh, the situation will uh, would double as well. Uh, however, in um, in terms of the population that is in uh, destitution, uh, London does the best. However, highest destitution is in southwest and northwest, nearly eight percent. So those are the darkest areas. And sorry, I forgot to, <laughs> to clarify the maps. On the left hand side, we see um, we would see the effects uh, in twenty twenty two without the pandemic. And on the right hand side, this is the effect with pandemic and Brexit. So as you see, it increases uh, dramatically. And um, so if the highest institution is in Southwest and Northwest, uh, we can also see the highest increase uh, in destitution. And these are in Southeast uh, region with 150% increase uh, in Wales, uh, West Midlands and Scotland. Uh, in a decreasing order. However, the, the impacts are uh, huge and without further um, interventions from the government, um, we will see a lot of people suffering and uh, living in, 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 in huge poverty. And there must be something done about this. Um, thank you. Diana, thank you very much. Uh, and some uh, very sobering uh, figures there on, uh, on, on levels of destitution, huge increases and indeed the um, consequences for uh, livelihood uh, of many people, families and communities uh, across the country. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists for these very rich uh, presentations. We have a few minutes. There've been three questions in the chat. So I'm going to uh, read out the first one and then uh, ask colleagues to respond. So the first question is from Ken Mulkern. And the question is as follows. The lockdowns in the UK have been less stringent than in France and Italy. Is it the case that the explanation for the service slump in the UK is voluntary social distancing? I'd like to ask my colleague uh, Kima to respond. Thanks Adrian and, and thanks again for the question. It's a very um, interesting question and one that we considered when we, um, <clears throat> when we made this chart. And, and, and you're right that in, in one possible explanation could be that it could be voluntary in terms of how the behavior of um, um, citizens and consumers in general. But one other thing that we have to consider is the, 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 type, the types of, uh, the different types of measures that are within these different type of countries. And more, more importantly, the, the relative importance of the subsectors 
that were most um, affected. So the, the relative import, importance of trade and communication and other, other services to services within these different countries might um, have might explain why it is that the UK had less stringent measure but a deeper fall in, in services. Thank you very much, uh, Kima. We have a question from Philip Davis, which uh, is as follows. Do the team see any specific financial stability risks for the UK or in the wider world economy in the context of the forecast, perhaps including uh, EME financing risks? Uh, I'm going to ask Hand in the first instance to respond, please. Hello, thank you for the question. So uh, we have been following the increase in debt to GDP levels, both uh, of the private sector and the government. And these debt to GDP levels have been in, uh, increasing since the global financial crisis, but with the uh, you know, government supports, government backed loans, and to uh, sh be shielded from the effects of the pandemic, as we all know, private sector indebtedness also rose by a lot. So, if uh, if government support schemes are also uh, quite um, uh, focused on the on 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 again uh, loan guarantees and uh, these kind of schemes rather than grants or more direct supports, uh, the private indebtedness could increase further and this could lead to higher bankruptcy rates. So this is a, something the private debt levels, corporate sector debt levels are uh, uh, rising further might be downside risks uh, to both the UK and, and the other economies. And on, on EMEs, there are specific risks concerning external finance, which are exacerbated by the second wave. Thank you very much, uh, Handa. Uh, for that. Uh, we have another question uh, from uh, Bernard Casey, um, and it's as follows. If Labour is to move away from contact intensive services, how does this match with demand for more healthcare services, in particular the need for increased long-term care services? What sort of uh, job uh, might job losers be seeking? How can we shift service sector labour into new sectors? And how much can we teach them IT skills if this is part of a transition to non-contact services. Uh, I'd like to ask Rory uh, to, uh, to respond to this question, please. Sure. Um, we need to distinguish a little bit, I think, between jobs which are becoming temporarily unviable but will be viable in the long run, others which are probably not going ever going to come back. And obviously we need different policies to respond to them. So, yeah, I mean, obviously in the long run, We'll probably want more people working in healthcare, and we certainly want more people working in, in, in the care sector. And I would say definitely better paid as well. This is one of the things that's been exposed during this. Um, some things, for example, like uh, retail, some of the physical retail jobs may not come back. One of the things that we've seen, and which we talk about in our chapter, is the fact that the output of the retail sector recovered in August to its pre pandemic levels but with at least 12% of the workforce still furloughed. So, you know, you, you, you're already producing more with fewer people. Or there have been new jobs created already in uh, online retail, for example. So some of that reallocation is likely to be happening already. And one of the other things which we've seen, again, uh, which we discussed there, thanks to research at the University of Kent, is that um, there's been a rise of two thirds in new firm incorporations in the online retail sector this year. Obviously overall, firm, new firm incorporations were hit very badly, but online retail, massive increase. So there's, there is reallocation happening uh, 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 already in some of those cases, but I would argue there is certainly um, a role for government, especially in some of those sectors which are very government led, uh, if not fully nationalized. Um, there's a big role for government to be uh, reallocating, retraining, reskilling um, people in those areas at a time when, yeah, when, when, when some of those jobs definitely won't be coming back. That's different to saying, for example, some of the, the skilled jobs, for example, in the arts and so on. Um, are we never ever going to return to, to having theatres? Probably not. Um, those jobs probably want to be protected. Thank you very much, uh, Rory, for those uh, thoughts. Um, there's a question on destitution. Was the same income threshold being used for London as nationally? I'd like to ask Elena to... Hi, um, 
Yes, it's a very, very good question. And to be consistent, uh, and we were looking at the national level, first of all, and then uh, regions, it, it is the same threshold. Um, but um, I, I think it's, it's a very good point and needs to be taken forward and we'll make sure um, that th this will be adjusted. However, the, uh, the, the shocks that the regions um, um, experience, they are by region. Uh, and also the income, uh, so that the earnings are also measured by region, but the threshold for destitution is the same for all regions. Thank you. And another question on destitution. In your projections for destitution, this is a question from Alice, did you take into account the effect of the furlough scheme and what other public policy has been taken into account? So, uh, yes, of course, and, and that's why we see much lower uh, effect of the pandemic in 2020, because it is um, um, mitigated by, uh, so reduced by, by the furlough schemes, by, by also we looked at the um, small business um, support, so uh, for self-employed people as well. So we, we did try to, to kind of uh, model the COVID situation as it is. Okay. Thank you very much uh, to all of our panelists. Thank you so much for joining us and for your questions this morning. It's been a very uh, rich set of presentations. Uh, all the questions were really excellent and thank you uh, for those. Please don't hesitate to get in touch with any of us uh, on these uh, topics. We're very happy to respond to questions uh, by email, um, over the phone. Uh, please do uh, come to us and we'll be happy to carry on the conversation after the briefing. But before uh, I uh, conclude, uh, just to leave you with perhaps two thoughts that I think come out very strongly from the presentations and also from the questions. One is there's a lot of economic and social scarring and this recession as well as the recovery uh, is not uh, following normal patterns. So there's a lot of analysis yet to be done about what sort of state of the economy will have and what society will look like as we come out out of COVID, perhaps in Q1 or Q2, and what the long-term effects are on social life. And the second thing that's, I think, emerging very clearly is the room for manoeuvre of government intervention and public policy generally. Nothing is inevitable. Nothing is uh, completely set in stone. There are path dependencies, but government intervention can still make a crucial difference. And certainly we at NISA will carry on analyzing the state of the economy and the state of society. And we will keep on developing public policies that we hope will make a contribution to the debate and indeed to the public good. Thank you all very much. Have a good day and please stay safe. Bye-bye.